Okay. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I am from Vancouver and I have to say I've been here since Monday and for those of you who live in Halifax, you already know this, but this is the most hospitable, like genuinely warm place, not physically, but emotionally, um, that I've been in a really long time and I've felt incredibly welcome this whole week. And just to touch on um, the introduction, so my talk is about a program um, that's run by the Vancouver Frame, but I am ha happy to talk about sort of the, the broader issues of sustainable seafood in general. Um, I don't really get into a lot of aquaculture, but if you have aquaculture questions, happy to delve into that um, as well. So uh, yeah, my name is Loren, and this is my talk from bars to barnacles. How many of you have heard of Ocean Y? Oh, see, okay, so you demographic because you're all wonderful. Um, so you've all seen our eco logo, yes? Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have seen it um, in a restaurant? Yeah, how many of you have seen it on, say, an item at a grocery store? Yeah, okay, that's okay. Um, have any of you specifically sought out OceanWise, like in terms of your purchasing decisions, either at a restaurant or a retailer? Getting, it's getting lower. Okay, that's okay. Um, so actually, the Vancouver Firm just did a poll this year of about 1,100 Canadians across the country. 68% um, of people in BC have heard of OceanWise, and over half, so 53% have actually participated in the program by buying um, OceanWise recommended seafood. Um, conversely, only a quarter of um, people living in the Maritime provinces have heard of OceanWise, and just 11% have participated in our program. Nationwide, about a third of people have heard of us and just under 20% have participated. So obviously huge numbers skewed toward the West Coast, even though we are a national program. Um, and I'm gonna sort of use this time to tell you about how it got started, some of our milestones, the activities we do, where we get our recommendations, and hopefully if that doesn't take an hour, um, I won't get squirted with water. Um, so why why did a program like OceanWise come about? So um, there's this very prominent chef in Vancouver named Rob Clark. He's the head of a, quite a fancy seafood restaurant called C. Um, and he started asking his suppliers, so where, he was asking them questions like, how is my fish caught? Who, where is it coming from? Why are you importing all this stuff from Hong Kong? So he started asking questions, but he was getting really conflicting answers from different suppliers and distributors. And there was no real cross-board definition of sustainable. So. Um, Rob being an environmentally conscious guy, and he wanted to serve good quality seafood, um, but that didn't have a, a significant environmental impact. He felt that suppliers weren't taking these questions and concerns seriously, so um, he actually ended up approaching the Vancouver Aquarium for help. And I'll get into that in a second, but as consumers, oftentimes fish is probably the most difficult product to differentiate, right? I mean, if you see a piece of fish that's been processed, it could be a piece of white fish, it could be anything from, from dolphin fish to halibut to, to cod, really. And, um, you know, more than vegetables or any other meat, it's, it's very difficult to tell a species of fish. And it's, it's absolutely impossible looking at that fish to tell how it was caught, where it was caught, you know, any, any ecological aspect of that fish is completely lost once it's been processed. Um, so for consumers, it's very challenging for people who want to buy certain types of seafood um, or aquaculture products. Um, so how did we work? So OceanWise is a public seafood recommendation program. Um, so we, we aim to raise awareness about sustainable seafood by targeting consumers, either through, uh, primarily through restaurant works. We work mostly with chefs um, and restaurants of various types. Um, and we, we have our eco label, which you saw at the beginning, and any items on a restaurant menu um, that we've deemed sustainable, um, get, you get to put that symbol beside your menu. So you could have a menu full of, full of seafood dishes, but only the ones that have been assessed to meet our sustainability criteria, you can put that little symbol beside it. And then consumers know that that's an ecologically sustainable option in terms of seafood. Um, so we do charge a fee for our program. Um, as of 2011, we started charging a fee um, to restaurants, um, suppliers, and other business partners. This has helped us become um, more independent from the Vancouver Aquarium. So we are affiliated with the aquarium. Um, we rely on them for quite a lot still, but uh, partner fees go toward paying our staff and 
things like that. But um, the premise of the program was, was entirely based around giving consumers the ability to make a choice with their seafood. Um, and so all of our recommendations, it's, um, all of the assessments are conducted by Seafood Watch um, and also OceanWise, but using the Seafood Watch criteria. For those of you who are who were at the talk last night, um, Ellen mentioned briefly Seafood Watch, which is out of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, so they write these assessments, and um, I'm going to go into those in a second. But OceanWise um, uses those assessments, and basically we're a binary scoring system. So depending on um, the fishery, um, it could come out as either ocean-wise or not. We don't do the red, yellow, green system that some um, that Seafood Watch does and some other um, eco certification programs. They do sort of a tiered system, but we just, it either is or it isn't by our standard. Um, and a really cool aspect of our program, I think, um, in terms of getting involved with the chef community is you don't have to be 100% ocean-wise to start. So like I mentioned, you could have a menu with 10 different seafood items. You just need one thing on there sort of to get you through the door, and then we, we strive for constant improvement um, with all of our different restaurant partners. Just a little bit of our program growth from Milestone. So that's Rob Clark there. Um, I mentioned that he approached the aquarium in 2005. He said, hey, you guys deal with fish. I need help with fish. What fish should I be serving to my, to my restaurant? Um, and so it kind of grew from there, and we moved to Alberta in 2007. Toronto in 2009, we had our first um, ethnic cuisine, our first Asian cuisine in 2012 partner. Um, in 2013, we had our first 100% sushi restaurant and we also had our first food cart. So we started in a very fine dining sort of spectrum, but we've, we've really branched out. Now we have partners in all sorts of different areas from food carts to bars to fine dining. Um, and then in 2015, we completed our first in-house assessment. Holy, is it really 11 minutes? Oh my god. I haven't practiced this. I'm so sorry. Okay, so how do we work? Um, we work mostly with chef partners. So like Ellen mentioned last night, um, the idea of promoting seafood through chefs, making seafood really cool. So um, these are some of our partners. Uh, Ned Bell is the top left corner. He actually just signed on to be uh, the Vancouver Aquarium's head chef. And this has just happened within about a week. He rode his bike across Canada trying to raise awareness for sustainable seafood. He's one of our biggest fans and supporters. Um, the guys in the middle there, so we had our first ever chowder smackdown in Wolfville. So we, we are kind of branching um, east. So it was kind of a, a different event for Ocean Wise because usually we are very much the white tablecloth for whatever reason, that's just how we started. But um, I was at the event in Wolfville and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, just more of our, our chef partners um, and sort of some of the work that they do. There's a lot of really good stuff going on with the chef community in terms of raising awareness about um, sort of underutilized species, things like limpets or whelks or gooseneck barnacles, things you wouldn't normally think of as seafood, um, but that are lower trophic level species and might have less of an environmental impact. Like I mentioned, we use um, the Seafood Watch standards. So they assess four aspects of a fishery. Um, they, there's eight aspects to aquaculture, but for the fisheries, uh, we don't just look at the target stock. So we, we look at, say you're fishing for albacore tuna, how healthy is that albacore tuna stock? Is it overfish? Is overfishing occurring? Okay, so we look at that. And we also look at the impacts of the gear. So what gear are you using? Does it have a lot of bycatch? Okay. Does it not, right? Is it, is it very target, targeted at the, at the species you're looking at? We look at the impact of that gear on the habitat. So obviously something like albacore or tuna fishing, you're not going to be scraping the bottom, but that could be a concern with something like harvesting scallops, right? So we take into aspects of um, habitat damage, and then we also look at holistic management effectiveness. Um, and the highest scoring yellow and green seafood items from Seafood Watch ultimately are ocean-wise recommended. Um, and this is kind of where I come in. So there was sort of an increasing interest in this sort of local by local movement. Um, chefs were looking to source more Canadian seafood. And so in 2014, OceanWise sort of expanded its scope and they hired um, me, a research fisheries research analyst, basically to start conducting small scale assessments for fisheries in Canada. So because Seafood Watch has a big emphasis on American fisheries and fisheries that have large imports into the US, they overlook a lot of the fisheries in our country. So OceanWise specifically hired me to start identifying and sort of broadening 
that five minutes. Awesome, awesome. Oh yeah, we get 20, thank God. Okay, um, so this was my first assessment. So this is actually pretty neat. There's this really small scale gooseneck barnacle off, uh, fishery off the coast of BC. They're taking like a ton of a year. It's, it's minute in the grand scheme of the world. Um, and the fishery reopened a couple years ago. Um, hand harvested, it's actually very, very dangerous, but um, these guys go out and they scrape gooseneck barnacles off the rocks. Um, some chefs in our community, Vancouver is kind of a foodie community, they got wind of this and they're like, wow, this, this is really cool, I want to put gooseneck barnacles on my menu, like, where can I get them? And there's this huge rage over gooseneck barnacles, Vancouver's weird, by the way, um, and they, they were named ingredient of the year. And then all of a sudden chefs who were involved in the OceanWise program started saying to us, well, can, can I serve them? Are they ocean-wise? I'm like, well, actually, we don't have an assessment for them. So the first assessment that I ever got to do was on gooseneck barnacles, which is something I literally knew nothing about until I did it. And I've learned that they're fascinating creatures, um, and also that this is an amazingly sustainable fishery. They're, they're harvested on specific rocks. Each of the rock has its own individual quota that's based, it's calculated based on three different types of stock assessments that are specific to gooseneck barnacles. It's overwhelming the amount of effort that they've actually put into trying to develop this fishery. Um, it's also completely First Nations operated, run, marketed. Um, there, well, there's a little bit of um, management assistance from different programs in Tofino, um, but effectively they're doing their own thing. And this got insane media coverage for Gooseneck Barnacles, like I didn't really believe it was gonna happen, but um, we went out with CBC, we had Bon Appetit Magazine come in. It was just, it was actually quite overwhelming for me. I was like, they're not. Great. Um, it depends how you cook them. I've eaten far too many barnacles, I have to tell you. Um, and they're quite expensive, but they are this niche item. And so we're trying to create awareness over things in our waters that are sustainable, but you might never have heard of. Um, another really neat story. So we collaborated with the Ecology Action Center. I got a call from um, one of the team members over there last fall, and he's like, hey, so there's this shrimp fishery up in Chetabacto Bay. Um, so the northern shrimp stock has been assessed by MSC, the mobile fleet, so the, the trawlers, but the trout fishery doesn't have a recommendation. We don't really, we don't think we can do it. Is it something that you guys would be interested in doing? It's like, yeah, absolutely, tell me more. So my second assessment, no, my third assessment was actually for this small scale, very low impact trout fishery in Chetabanto Bay, just off of Canso. Um, again, guys doing really cool things. Um, that, that don't impact the environment. Um, it goes on, Cambridge Bay Arctic Char, it's just, it goes on. Um, but I, I, and I know the whole theme of this conference is ocean optimism, but I have to obviously mention a few tough parts. Um, the first one being obviously that we are mostly recognized in Western Canada still. That's a byproduct of just having an office in Vancouver and we do have a small office in Toronto, but beyond that, it's kind of me coming here to talk at things like this, or I, I was fortunate to meet some people when I came and met the fishers in Canso. So it's really tough getting across the country. We hope to branch out, but that's something we're still struggling with. Brand enforcement, that's obviously gonna be a concern when you have a staff of seven people. How do we make sure that everyone is using our logo correctly um, and they're sourcing what they say that they're gonna be sourcing? For me personally, um, I am working with small scale fisheries, so there is a lack of data. So I was looking at a, a uh, really interesting whelk fishery, and you know the last stock assessment was from like 2003. How do I work with that? So unfortunately, there's just not a lot of up-to-date information for a lot of our smaller um, fish stocks in our country because that's not really been a focus of DFO until recently. Hopefully, this is going to change. Um, so it is difficult to write these reports accurately. Um, I do the best I can. For me personally, sort of rec reconciling ecological sustainability with social factors. So um, I, I was on a conversation with um, a guy out at Fogo Island. So they're doing this really neat um, project where they're trying to revitalize the Fogo Island community in Newfoundland. And he's saying, hey, we'd love to get Arctic cod ocean-wise recommended and all this stuff. And I said, unfortunately, I love what you're doing. I think it's phenomenal. But at the same time, my criteria only look at the ecological sustainability. And right now, cod is still listed as endangered. So that's a huge factor in how I conduct my assessment. And while I completely agree with what he's doing in terms of revamping cod and giving people jobs, I can't account for it in my assessments, at least using what I do. 
And yeah, just finding the balance like that between mission and application. Like I realized that there are restaurants who are gonna join our program because they just want publicity. They wanna show that they're doing these awesome initiatives with sustainable seafood. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, that's one more person involved and hopefully they're at least spreading the right message. Um, lots of, lots, where next? I won't bother if you have questions about where next. Thank you so much for your time. Big shout out to the teacher.